Christian Living 101 presents a Bible class on the fundamental basics of victorious Christian living. Establish a strong foundation for conquering the trials and temptations of daily life. Increase your faith and learn to use the powerful weapons of spiritual warfare as you study with Pastor Gene Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask you to anoint the word today as it goes forth. Anoint this pastor as we try to divide it to the glory of God. We pray, Lord, that you'll prosper each and every one of us as we read and study the word of God together. And we give you praise and glory in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, our study today is number six in a series entitled Prepare for Adversity. The subtitle will be Get Your Family in Order. Now all of us realize, I think, that we're headed for harder times and more difficult times as Christians in this old ungodly world in which we live. Uh, we're beginning to see persecution. We're beginning to see opposition on every hand. We're beginning to see Christians either laughed at and mocked at or ridiculed and condemned. And one of the things that we need to deal with if we're going to be able to face the problems that lie ahead in the power and the ability of Almighty God through faith in His name and the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, we had better get our family all straightened out and in order. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. First, we're going to have um, our morning worship. Jim Lynch will be leading us in a song. And also, uh, my wife Beth will be leading us in a hymn. And we're going to uh, then go right into the study entitled, uh, Get Your Family in Order. And we'll talk to you about why that's necessary. Now, here we are. Let's get ready and sing together as we worship the Lord in song. Are you about ready? Okay. I heard an old old story How a Savior came from the Lord How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his glory Of his precious love Then I
important for us to get our family in order? Well, let's just stop and think about it. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but the unity of the household, of mom and dad together in agreement, and the children in order and respecting and honoring their parents and, and uh, being tutored by their parents and prepared for life outside of the home, all of that is very important. Yes, this pastor is aware. There's many families out there that have only one parent. And in that situation, you say, well, pastor, what can I do? Well, it's tragic that that's the situation. But we need to realize that doesn't leave your situation in the household uh, any different. Uh, wh whoever is a leader, whether you're the mother or the father, if you're a single parent and you've got children you have to raise, uh, uh, then you need to understand the importance of standing together in one accord. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the role of the children, and we'll speak a little bit about the role of the parents, uh, but I want you to be reminded of something that's very important, and that is that uh, today we live in a situation where our children have no preparation for life outside the home, uh, most of our kids go to school, uh, they come home from school, and on the way home they've got their uh, little electronic devices and they're either emailing or, or uh, texting someone. Uh, their mind is totally off of anything that's going on around them. They get home, the TV goes on. If there's a smart parent, the parent insists that they uh, take care of their schoolwork first and, and get prepared for the next day in school. But in many instances, uh, uh, the minute the door latches behind them, either the electronic gadgets go on or the television goes on, and there they sit, and oblivious to anything around them. There's no conversation at the table during dinner. There's no time for them in the early morning hour getting ready for school and, uh, to sit and get some leadership and instruction or devotion unto the Lord before they start the day. In most cases, we find that our children are growing up uh, uh, isolated in a crowd. And because of that, and, uh, they are not prepared to face the things that they're going to have to deal with uh, in the near future. In fact, the moment they're out on their own, and even before that, in their teenage years, they're going to face complications and problems and, and oppression, and they're going to be challenged in every area of their life. And if they haven't been given the foundational truth of the Word of God about holy living, about godly living, about keeping themselves chaste and pure until they're married, about how to deal with kids that are determined to lead them into the uh, subculture of drugs and alcohol and, and uh, all of those things that destroy the body and the mind. Uh, if they aren't prepared at home, they won't be prepared. And you'll find that in spite of how much you have, quote, loved them and how much you have provided for them in tangible things, uh, that somehow or another uh, they do not follow the pathway that you'd like for them to follow once they grow a little bit older and especially in their late teens and, and uh, after they enter into the college age. Uh, 
they're out of your hand. And so they're left helpless to know what to do. Sometimes they don't even realize what's right and wrong. And so may I challenge you today to realize that the most uh, powerful force in the world today is a godly family united together in agreement on the Word of God, committed unto the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Redeemer, determined to live a life of, that will take them into eternity with the Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus for the ages to come. Where are they going to get that instruction? Well, if you're fortunate enough that they go to a, a Christian school, they will get a little bit of it there. But we need to remember that oftentimes Christian schools are used uh, uh, to house, uh, shall we call it, difficult children that need help. Uh, and oftentimes the student body is mixed with uh, those who are not serving the Lord at all, even though they're in a Christian school. And so, uh, Mom and Dad, if you are together, and I pray that you are, uh, the important thing is the two of you have an important relationship, a loving relationship, a peaceful relationship, that the home might be filled with the peace of God. And we'll talk about that later. What is more important than anything as we discuss this lesson is those little ones that you brought into the world need to be formed and established in that kind of a household uh, long before they're aware of what the outside world holds for them. And so I'm going to talk to you today about what you need to do in behalf of your children and about what the children need to do in respect to their parents. So with that, I'm going to get into the Word now, and we're going to take you to a portion of Scripture found in Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll begin reading with verse number 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now in the Old Testament, we know that God made it very plain that the parents are responsible for the children, and they are to see to it and give forth discipline accordingly, uh, to keep the children in line, to let them know who's in authority, and to let them know that they're not running the household, as most of the children are today. Now look at Ephesians 6, verse 2. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And then verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now children, those of you that are old enough to understand, uh, I want you to listen very carefully. It says, children, obey your parents, for this is right. In other words, it's your obligation, the right thing to do. Now it doesn't say that you are to obey your parents if you agree with them. It doesn't say that you're to obey your parents if uh, somehow or another you feel like that uh, they're wrong or they haven't the ability or they don't care about you. Uh, the important thing is to remember that the Word of God makes a command. It isn't uh, if you would like to. It isn't if it feels good. It isn't that you obey your parents if everything is just the way you want it. It means that you obey your parents without condition. And I want you to understand something, children. There are no experienced parents. Well, now people say, well, you know, it's really hard on the firstborn. If you're the first one that's born into the family, whether you're a boy or a girl, uh, you're going to have a harder time because uh, your parents haven't raised any children yet. And I want you to know that that's a wrong idea. The idea is that your mom and your dad, your parents, have, are uh, responsible for you. They are responsible to see to it that you have the spiritual foundation, uh, the tangible foundation, the uh, emotional foundation, uh, that you can go forth in the world when that time comes for you to uh, step out into the ungodly world that's going to bring pressure against you in every kind of a way that you can imagine in many ways that you can't even think of today. And so 
I want you to understand something, children. It doesn't say that if I like my parents, I have to obey them. It doesn't say if I agree with them, I have to obey with them. It doesn't say that if I, if I, uh, I find myself in a place where uh, they just give me everything I want, that I have to obey them. No, it says that they are to be obeyed whether they are right or wrong in your analysis or in your mind as to how things are going. And the reason you are to obey them is because that's God's structure for the family. Now, just to give you a little overview, I'm speaking particularly to the children today, but I want you to stop and think about this. God made this kind of an arrangement for the family. God is always to be first in, in the family's life. Dad is to put uh, uh, God first. Mom is to put God first. Then after that, we find that uh, uh, the husband is responsible for making decisions uh, that are vital to the household. Uh, and uh, uh, he and mom uh, uh, are to uh, uh, get together as one. Remember, they're all one flesh now. They're to get together as one, come to an agreement on any given situation. But the father is responsible for seeing to it that that uh, a decision is followed through and is uh, brought to pass according to uh, the word of God and the decision of the household. Now, if there is no father in the household, then mom has to play a double role. She has to be mother and father in responsibility and see to it that things go according to the directions of the word of God. Now, if it's the other way around and the father is raising the children, there's no mother in the home, for whatever reason, it doesn't make any difference, and then he has to also play the role of father and mother, and we understand that. And so, children, you need to know that when you're in that kind of a situation, your parent has a, a double load to carry, and you need to be very conscious of, of your responsibility to obey them and not make trouble for them as they try to guide you through the life that is ahead. Now, I want to tell you something, parents and children. There are no experienced parents. Well, you know, the second child has a better chance because, after all, the parents got experience. Nope, wrong. Wrong again. Why? Because there's no two children alike. What works with one child will not work with the other. What works with the first two won't work with the third one. What works with the third one won't work with the fourth one because every one of them are completely different people. They have different emotions, they have different ideas, uh, they have different outlook on life, they have different situations to live with, because now where there was uh, mom and dad, hopefully, and one child, now there's uh, another child. So now there's mom and dad and two children. Well, now the, both children uh, have to do some adjustment because of the second one that came along. The same thing happens with the third and the fourth and however many there, there may happen to be. So the point I'm making to you, uh, parents and children, is that you as parents are responsible to set the tone, to see to it to, that your children are instructed and guided and uh, uh, by both the example and declaration, see to it that they put God first in their life and that they are uh, grilled into the reality that our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Redeemer Jesus the Christ uh, is the only way to travel in this old world because we are preparing for eternity with them rather than the uh, judgment and degradation that lies ahead for those who rebel against God and refuse to serve Him. And so your children are going to be persecuted because they're Christians. Children, you'll have to face the fact that people won't like you because uh, uh, you're a Christian. You're trying to do the right thing. And most of them uh, out there that are not Christians have no desire to do the right thing, don't even understand what the right thing is in many instances. And as a result, if you follow them, you'll be led down a, a dark, blind path that leads into eternal judgment without God. Now... 
In that situation then, the first commandment for the children is, Children, obey your parents, for this is right. It doesn't say, if you think your parents love you, or they don't, or they're right and not wrong, or wrong and not right. It doesn't matter what your parents are and what they do. You are to respect them and obey them as they give you direction. Because most parents, and I realize there may be one or two and a hundred or even a thousand, uh, that are not uh, uh, interested in the well-being of their children. Tragically, today, there's more of those like that than there used to be. But I want you to understand, children, you need to obey them because they're your parents. Now, the next verse said something that is very important. It said, honor your parents. Let's read it again just to make sure that we understand. Verse 2 in Ephesians number 6 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, children, what is that promise? The promise is that you'll be blessed, you'll be uh, uh, brought into uh, the standards of light that will give you a good foundation for facing the things of this world, and, and uh, you'll find yourself in a position where, uh, as you honor your father and mother, uh, it is a commandment of promise, or with promise, because it declares that if you do, you also will live a long life. Now, it's... Uh, not uh, very often that I meet people who say, "Well, you know, I I just uh, I don't want to live any longer. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna forget it. I don't want to live any longer." And you children, you will come to that point in your life where you'll throw up your hands and you'll cry and you'll whimper and you'll throw a tantrum and you'll stomp your feet and you'll uh, put up all the uh, nasty uh, verbalization you can against your parents of uh, trying to get them to bend in the direction and the instruction that they've given you. I want you to know you're making a big mistake. You will answer to God for that. And, and not only that, it will affect you throughout all the days of your life ahead. Because your parents are trying to guide you into the pathway of righteousness, which God says is a narrow pathway. It doesn't have a lot of room to mingle with the world and do worldly things, but it's a straight and narrow pathway that leads to eternal life through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, children, that's what you want to find, and that's where you want to walk. It will do you well in the days ahead, believe me. Yes, you'll pay a price in persecution, and you'll pay a price in uh, kids mocking you and laughing at you and, and uh, bullying you. You'll pay a price because of you dare to be different than they are. But all oh, the thing that you inherit uh, because you pay that price is beautiful and wonderful and a perfect life throughout all the ages to come after your spirit leaves this body and uh, goes to be with the Lord should you die before he returns as our Lord and King. If he returns as our Lord and King and you're still alive, instead of uh, uh, your body uh, uh, departing from your spirit or your spirit departing from your body, uh, you're going to find that all at once in a twinkling of an eye, your body is going to take on an incorruptible form that cannot be destroyed, it can't be hurt, it can't be maimed, it can't feel pain, can't feel heat or cold, but it's going to be a body of expression that will allow you to enjoy life throughout all the ages, and that's according to the scripture of God. Now, so we go on from there, well what does honor your parents mean? It means that you give unto them respect, you give unto them uh, appreciation for the efforts that they go through, both to rear you in your tangible area of need and to instruct you in your emotional and in your spiritual area of development, and that you need to respect and honor them because they care enough about you to make the way for you in life and, and uh, to take care of you and to feed you and to nurture you in every area that they can as Christian parents. If you're not in a Christian home, uh, then uh, begin to pray and ask God to lead your parents unto the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
It doesn't mean you can force them to serve the Lord. It doesn't mean you feel contempt for them because they don't serve the Lord. Instead, because of your love and your concern and your care for your parents, which is part of honoring your parents, that you will go about your business as though they were Christians, obey them whether you think you should be obedient or not, because the Word of God commands you to do it, and then from there you can look forward to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father uh, bringing them into a point where you as a family can be bonded together as one. Now, I want you to know something, parents. Uh, children do not like to be disciplined, but they need to be, and they want to be. Now you say, I thought you said they didn't like it. They don't, but at the same time, if they do not get discipline, if they do not get to clear direction and instruction, there's something within them that causes them to know that they are not really loved and they're not really being prepared for life. Even though the immature uh, feelings and, and uh, uh, excitements of this old world uh, may have a hold upon them, you need to know that if you don't uh, direct them into the right pathway, uh, they are going to forever miss that, and you're going to forever regret that, uh, parents, and so do it, whether it's easy or whether it isn't. Because the child that acts up and never gets disciplined, and he acts up some more, or she acts up some more, is really saying to you, Mom, Dad, when are you going to stop me? When are you going to start to, uh, giving me some strong direction and guidance? Uh, when are you going to uh, come to a point where you've had enough of, and you become a man or a woman enough to act as my adult parent and to love me enough to care for me and to get me started out right? You say, well, they don't think all that through. No, they may not. But down deep within their spirit, that the very situation resides and, and they know that something is not right. Because, you see, God made the children in such a way that they are dependent upon their parents, they're supposed to be, and they need to be dependent upon their parents. And, and so, children, you need to appreciate the fact, and, and sometimes mom and dad will discipline you, and you'll say, I didn't deserve it, I didn't do that, and that may be true. Just remember, they love you, and they're trying to do the best for you, and uh, they more than than make up any mistakes that they've made in raising you as they care for your needs day by day, love you, watch over you, and try to establish you in the righteous way to serve Almighty God and to be victorious as we live here upon this earth. Okay, verse 3 says that it may be well with you and that thou mayest live or you may live a long life on earth. Okay. Uh, I don't think any of you are in a hurry to leave this earth. Most of you aren't. And if you are, you've got a problem that you really need to take to the Lord and to your parents. And uh, I think you'll find if you take it to your parents, they'll help you to find a way to take it to the Lord. And it will be a good thing for you. Now, I know that there are households where mom or dad is a Christian and the other one is not. I understand that. Well... Let's find out what the responsibility is in that case. In fact, it does not change at all. You are to obey them whether or not they're serving the Lord or whether they are united in what they do and how they live. Uh, you'll find that many children today have parents that are constantly squabbling, constantly quarreling, can't get along with each other. In fact, they despise each other. And there's constant war in the home. And there's no peace at home. There's no situation at home uh, wherein they want to go and be part of that household. And so, believe it or not, uh, they will find some friend somewhere that they can spend most of their time with. And all too often, it's a friend that is not a friend at all, but one that will lead them down the pathway of ungodliness, rebellion, and iniquity that is beyond comprehension. And so, parents, uh, 
Uh, I'll talk to you about this a little bit later next week, but I want you to realize, just as sort of a precursor, you need to find a way to be peaceable at home and have a home that is filled with the peace and the love of God. And as I said, we'll talk about that next week. Hope you'll tune in. Now, because I told you what we're going to talk about, don't say, I don't want to hear that. You need to hear it, and I'll tell you what the Word says, and that you, then you have to decide what you're going to do with it. But uh, ignorance of the Word is not an excuse. Just as ignorance of the law, uh, the officer will tell you, uh, is not an excuse. And so I want us to come to a point of reality that we recognize that when a home is united together, where mom and dad get along beautifully, love the Lord, love each other, where the parents love the children and the children know it, and, and the children are not constantly bickering and fighting and trying to play one parent against the other, etc. When all the members of the household are in order and doing their best to live for the Lord, you'll find that there is a bond there that cannot be broken. Therefore, when oppression comes, hardships come, uh, maybe there's a lack of income, maybe there's no food to eat, maybe there's physical danger that's uh, uh, coming before you, and, and you need to have the strength to come against it and to stand firm in the face of its onslaught. Uh, whatever the situation may be, a family that stands together is much stronger than individuals of the family trying to do it in themselves. And I want you to know that the things that are going to happen in the near future in our land and around the world are going to command and demand a position of unity and oneness in the family. And we've got to get back to getting our family together, becoming one in the sight of God, becoming one in the face of the enemy around about us, and, and stand our ground as a unit because uh, uh, the unit is much stronger than the individual standing by themselves. And you can look out for each other. You can pray for each other. You can protect each other. You can help provide for each other. There's many, many ways that that statement is true. And so, beloved, I just want you to be reminded that um, if you're going to prepare for the dark days ahead, you need to prepare your family to face it. And you do that by following the commandments of God in rearing the family and dealing with the sanity and sanctity of the home between mom and dad. And uh, as I've said before, if there's only one parent, then that parent has to do double duty. It's more important than ever for that one and the children to be united in one accord and stand together because there will be strength there that uh, is beyond understanding and there will be spiritual strength there because of the unity within the body of the home uh, that you can take unto the Lord. There's no door that slams shut before you because uh, you're not in speaking terms with the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So, beloved, it's important that you serve the Lord. It's important, children, that you obey your parents, that you love your parents, that you honor your parents, and you need to realize that with that comes an absolute promise that you will be treated well in this world. That means your needs will be met in this world and that uh, you will live a long life in this world and God will support and provide for you as the need is. Not giving you everything you want, but providing for you what you need. And when your strength is exhausted, children, when you come to the place you don't know what to do or how to do it, you can always turn to your parents, and you can turn to your Heavenly Father, and you can say, Parents, I need help. And you can say to your Heavenly Father, Father, help me and my parents, whatever the situation may be. And you can be strong in faith. The Bible makes it plain and clear that little children and young children have greater faith than what adults understand. And so it may be, children, because you're obedient and because you respond as you should respond unto your parents, 
that um, your faith um, is the thing that will help your parents and the rest of the family accomplish what they need to accomplish in the face of adversity and be preserved in the kingdom of God. Well, I'm sure it's time for me to move on from here. And next week we're going to be talking about the responsibility and indeed some of the things that will help parents as they serve the Lord and rear their children. You see, children, you have a responsibility to your parents. That's what we're talking about today. I'm going to talk next week about the parents' responsibility to you. And just as you have a responsibility to God, your parents have responsibility to God. And we'll talk to them next week. And I want you to hear it too. And we'll tell them what their responsibility unto God is and how God can help them to be the parent that they need to be. And so I suppose by this time we probably need to cease the study, close it down, and prepare for communion. And so I hope you'll enjoy the ministry and song as we make ready to serve communion together. And by the way, if you're a child of God, born into the kingdom, and washed in the blood of the Lamb, and uh, you've been baptized uh, and repented, according to Acts 2.38, uh, and you're really a child of God, a citizenship in His kingdom, I want you to know that you need to take communion with us. And you're more than welcome to do that at home. And you can prepare for that now. And uh, if, uh, if not, uh, then if you're not serving the Lord, or if you have a, a sin in your life since you made a confession uh, of a, a conversion unto the Lord, it's time for you to clean up your act, get that sin out of your life, repent of it, and uh, get cleansed anew and afresh at the fountain of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there you'll find the peace and, and the promise and the benefits and the blessing that are yours as you receive communion. And so let's now turn to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. We'll go to chapter 11 and we'll begin reading with verse number 24. We'll do that just as soon as the song is completed. God bless you. We look forward to serving you communion in just a few moments. <laughs> Answers 
He sent it like a dove Lord, I thank you for your blessing And Jesus, I now know The meaning of unconditional book of 1st Corinthians chapter number 11 and it says uh, in verse 24 that when he had given thanks speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ of course when he had given thanks uh, he break it speaking of the bread and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup and when he sub saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood this do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, that means honor, reverence, respect, to the Lord's death till he come. And now verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now you remember I told you just a few moments ago, if you're not a Christian or if you are a Christian and you drifted back into sin, you've got sin in your life, don't take communion because it will actually become a curse to you. And that's because of the Word of God demands us to come before the Father in the name of Jesus and we cannot do that if we have been separated in fellowship of from the Lord and the Father because of sin within our life. And so it's important to get straightened out and cleansed and then take communion. Now there are those out there that teach, and I, uh, I'm diverting here a little bit, but there are those that teach, oh, if you go and take communion uh, once a week or once a month, uh, it really doesn't make any difference whether there's sin in your life. Communion takes care of it. It's not what the Bible says. And since the Bible doesn't say that, I wouldn't take the risk of, of going against what the Bible does say. And so the Bible says, if there's sin in your life, don't do it. If there is not sin in your life, you do it till uh, you receive communion, and you do it as an act of honor, respect, love, and obedience uh, unto God the Father, and uh, in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Redeemer and mine. And so we go on now. It says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And you know, I can't tell you, you know, that down through the years, Pastor Applegate's been uh, given grace by the Lord to pray for the sick and have seen many, many miraculous healings. But I've also seen many, many come time and time again for prayer, and they, they say, I want to be healed. I know God wants to heal me. I have the promise of healing in the Scriptures, and I want to be healed. 
But the problem is they want to be healed, but they don't want to give up the sin and the corruption that's in their life. And so the Bible tells us what happens next. It says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That word sleep is another word for having entered into death. Now, verse 31. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And you may say, you know, Pastor, it just seems like the Lord won't let me alone. He's always on my case about something. Well, wise up. If he's on your case about something, it's because he loves you. It's because he wants you to change your ways. It's because he wants to bless you and uh, get you free from the bondage that you're under because of your disobedience and rebellion and the corruption and sin that's within your life. And so get things right with God. And if you do, you're not going to be sick because you didn't. And you're not going to die because you didn't. But you're going to be sustained in life, protected and strengthened by Almighty God. And you're going to walk in the fullness of the revelation and supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And, and God will be with you. And no, don't forsake communion uh, because there's sin in your life. Rather, forsake sin in your life so that you can receive communion if you get the point. Now, as we take of the bread, it represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded of the beating that he took at the whipping post. Uh, the stripes upon his back where the chips of steel or, or bone in the throngs upon the end of the whip uh, came down against his back and when they were pulled away tore the flesh off of his back. Uh, we're reminded of the thorns that was placed upon his head uh, as he approached the cross and uh, the spear that was in the side. All of that we're very familiar with. I want you to understand something. He took all of that because of you and me. We deserve those stripes. We deserve those thorns. We deserve uh, the, the abuse that came upon him, the pulling out of his beard, etc. That was, that was our punishment for our ungodly deeds and our unrighteousness that he took upon himself for us. And then as his blood spread forth through the, uh, the veins and dripped down into the earth, uh, I want you to understand that the shedding of his blood was given that you and I might be redeemed and brought back into the kingdom of God. The Bible says there's no remission of sin. That means there's no removal, evaporation of sin from your life uh, without the shedding of blood. Jesus shed that blood for you and for me. And so as we take of the bread now and eat together, let's rejoice in him. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the symbol of your suffering. As we eat of it today, we acknowledge that it has deep meaning and spiritual and physical strength for us in our body this day. And we receive it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. Let us eat together. take the cup. It's grape juice. Represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was spilled for you and for me. 
And again, this is a price that was paid for us, that we might not have to pay it. And see, since we were not pure and was not clean, had sin from the day we were born, because we had inherited it uh, from uh, Adam himself, I want you to understand, beloved, that this is the most precious gift that we can possibly have. And as we take of this juice of the vine, as we drink together, let us remember that it seals a New Testament covenant with us that through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Redeemer, our sacrificial offering, the shedding of His blood for our sin, that we have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us drink together. Praise the Lord. You have been listening to Christian Living 101 with Pastor Gene Applegate. This study is presented without church or organizational bias. We are totally supported by your prayers and generosity. Your comments and questions are welcome. Email us at gene at christianliving101.org or write to Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. That's gene at christianliving101.org or write us at Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050.